friends! As you can tell, I am back home from Denver and wanted to give a little introduction to the panel that I did. So when I applied to go to Denver and registered, they had a little option saying, would you like to run a panel? If so, fill out this additional application. So I did. And about a month later, I was told, yes, you're in. Go for it. And I went, oh, I really wasn't expecting that because it's my first time running a panel. I am not known in the furry fandom because I'm kind of more furry adjacent, I would say. Um, mostly because I have zero interest in having a fursona or getting a fursuit, but I really like the community. There's a lot of fun people around and amazing artists and storytellers. So I, as typically happens, spend way too much money. But my panel is on anthropomorphic myths. It's about an hour long, and I hope you enjoy it. So how's everyone's con been? I know for my part, I am reaching a point where I'm like, oh god, caffeine. Please save the wheel, caffeine. Because I have not had enough sleep. Don't know about the rest of you. <laughs> so, today we are talking about anthropomorphic myths. Where did they come from? Why does every culture seem to have them? And how are they different? And their evolution throughout time. So the question is, why should you listen to this weirdo at the front of this room? What on earth do I happen to know about mythology? I have been a practicing folk healer for the last 10 years. I do a lot of tarot, I do Reiki, and one thing I have learned throughout this entire process, you can't help people if you don't know where they came from. I can't talk to a Christian the same way I can talk to a Buddhist. They do not like being talked to with the other person's vocabulary. So I have spent a lot of time over the last decade going, okay, I have this person who's come to me and I know nothing about their belief system. Please, tell me. Educate me on your beliefs because I want to be able to help you. My job as a folk healer is to say, all right, you have something going wrong in your life and it's because your actions and your beliefs are not in alignment. It's not my job to tell you what to believe. It's my job to help you figure out what you do believe. And that is why I have studied so much mythology because that's where the basis of so many of our beliefs come from. So we're going to start by defining two words. The first one is anthropomorphic. I'm betting someone in the audience knows what that is. <laughs> Does anyone want to share a concise definition of anthropomorphic? Human form. Human form of what? The literal word definition. Yes. But when we're using it in mythology, it's that some other thing, animal, object, natural phenomenon, has been given a human form or personality. So, what is a myth? Does anyone know what that is? I see some shock books. Yes! story to explain a natural phenomenon. So, why are we having so many myths that involve anthropomorphized animals? Well, go back to our hunter-gatherer days. What did people interact with most? Animals. What was the most dangerous thing to them outside of other people? <laughs> animals. <laughs> so today, we're going to talk about four different types of animals how they've been anthropomorphized, and then we'll have a general discussion of how have their mythological roots changed in our modern time as we have become a more global society with Hollywood getting their little fingers into everything and trying to homogenize it. So the four things we will be talking about today, I know the first one's a crowd favorite, foxes. <laughs> Number two, we will be talking about snakes. Ooh. 
Number three, we will be talking about spiders. Ooh. Ooh. And number four, we will be talking about ravens and crows. Ooh. Because unfortunately in mythology, they always get put together. And you can almost never separate the two because you talk to this civilization that's like 30 minutes by bus from this one, and they tell the exact same story, but here it's a crow and there it's a raven. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, for the fox, actually, indeed, let's look at this first one. We're going to real quick talk about three different stories of foxes from around the world. The first one, which I'm going to read a fair bit about because uh, it is the one that I learned most recently and do not have fully memorized, which is Ayash and the Fox Lady. The second is Renard the Fox, which is from medieval Europe. And the third, I'm just leaving it more broad because there's lots of stories about them, which I know is probably also a crowd favorite, Kitsune. Ooh. So, starting with Ayash and the Fox Lady. To clarify, this is a Native American myth. It has been retold by probably 50 different tribes. This is a kind of generic, most people agree on these details. But not everyone. So, don't sue me if you find another tribe that has a different opinion on this story. To begin with, there are two Ayash. There is Ayash the Elder and Ayash the Younger. The Elder Ayash had two wives his older wife, who was the mother of Ayash the Younger. And then the <coughs> second wife, who, as mythology goes, is so much prettier and younger and wants her children to inherit one, doesn't she? So what does she do? She talks to Ayash the Elder and says, Your son's conspiring against you. He wants to take all that is yours and make it his own. So the Ayash the Elder goes, well, no, I don't want to be supplanted. So he hatches a plan. He says, Ayash, my son, we will travel. Let's go find this prime hunting ground. So they get in their canoe, they go to an island, and Ayash the Elder says, this is the perfect place. We're going to find good game here. And as soon as Ayash the Younger steps out of the canoe, whoop, goodbye. <laughs> there goes Ayash the Elder, leaving the younger on the, on the beach, crying out to his father, Why are you abandoning me? What did I do? But his father does not answer, and just goes down the river and leaves poor Ayash the Younger there. So what is he to do? Abandon on this island? Well, in comes Serpent. And Serpent says, I can help you. I can lead you to shore. I am a good swimmer. And Ayash says, Yeah, that checks out. Let's go. <laughs> but don't we know some things about snakes? Snakes are tricky. Snakes are liars. Snakes are venomous. Do we want to trust a snake? Probably not in Native American mythology. Although, it depends on the tribe, as always. In this case, he should not have trusted Snake. But luckily, he is a good, proud brave. And he has a spirit watching over him. So the Thunderbird watches this interaction and goes, No, I'm not going to leave you in Snake's clutches. And so waits for the opportune moment where Snake has just gotten him to shore swoops down and drags Snake away. Exit stage left. <laughs> but what does poor Ayash do? Now he is lost and alone in the wilds. He has no food. He does not have his bow. He does not have tools. Well, he does what any smart person does and goes, is there any smoke on the horizon? Because if there's smoke, there's people. He does see smoke on the horizon. And he goes to a hut where he finds an oldish woman. Stories vary. Sometimes she's young, sometimes she's a grandmother. But always she has.
has a pot of stew or porridge or soup, something to warm the bones. He says, oh, please may I partake of your meal. She says, on one condition, you must consume all of it. And so he looks at the pot and goes, eh, it's just one pot. No big deal. So he tries to drink it. And when he looks back in the pot, it hasn't changed. There's the same amount. And he says, great spirit, bless me that my stomach can contain rivers. And he tries again. And it doesn't work. There's still more. And he says, oh no. Great spirit, bless my stomach that I may consume a pond. And he tries again. Still, there's like half of it. He goes, oh no. How am I going to do this? What's bigger than a pond? What's bigger than a river? I know. Great spirit, bless me that my stomach may consume oceans. <laughs> and he finishes the pot. But everyone knows after eating that much, you're tired. You want a nap. So he falls asleep. In the morning, the woman is gone. And in her place is a fox. And the fox speaks to him and says, you have my meal, for I am the woman you spoke to last night. I cannot aid you on your entire journey, but this I can do for you. I can lead you to the next path. And so she does. And then she exits the story. So that's where we will stop with Ayash and the box lady. Foxes throughout mythology, throughout Many cultures are cunning. They're tricksters. But they're also, quite often, helpful. Just not in the way people want. Because, do you think Ayash wanted to eat an ocean worth of stew? I mean, how many here think that they could eat an ocean worth of stew? Oh, we've got some brave takers back there. I guess you've got the, the bottomless stomach and the empty legs for, for access storage. <laughs> so, we're going to now move on to our second fox. This time from Europe instead of Native America. So, Renard the Fox is seen in a large number of Aesop's like fables, mostly from Germany and France, according to my research, but then kind of spread out all over as the printing press and cell phones and the internet became available. The key with Renard is almost always he is the weaker. He is the smaller person in the story because he's normally facing off against bear or against wolf or against man. And he's just a little fox. So how does he deal with this problem? Well, he's smart. And he goes, I know how to deal with Wolf. Wolf is always hungry. So I'll promise him food. And I'll lead him to Bear and say, hey, look, Bear has food. See? You just have to take it from Bear. You can do that, right? You're a big, bad wolf. You're powerful. And then Renner just kind of laughs at them as they're fighting and runs away with all food. <laughs> as foxes do. Next is Kitsune. Who here have heard of Kitsune? Figures. So, where are Kitsune from? Yes. Yeah. So, this is a good answer here. We hear China and we hear Japan. Both are technically correct. They just have different stories. There's also a remarkably similar creature in Korea who you do not want to meet, named Gumaho. Because where Kitsune get more tales through age and wisdom, Gumaho get it from stealing human souls. So if you come across a Kitsune in Japan, 
they typically fall into one of three categories. There are shrine guardians. These are the noble creatures of myth and lore who say, this is my place. All who come with respect are safe under my roof. Then there's the second kind, who are referred to as field consume. They're the ones who are the tricksters. They're the ones who, you're out chopping wood, and suddenly there's a beautiful maiden before you who says, Oh, such a strong man. Please, I need help. My poor child is trapped under a tree, and only you can save him. Only to lead him into the middle of the bog and leave him there. <laughs> For fun, because they thought it was just a little prank. It's not a big deal. And then the third kind are the ones that you do not want to meet. These are the pissed off land guardians, who you almost never met. Because normally they are attached to a shrine, but if a shrine is destroyed, you do not want to meet the wrath of that Kitsune. One of the common things about Kitsune is that they are a forest bride, a wild bride. Because sometimes instead of leading you off into the woods and saying, hey, I need help, only to leave you trapped somewhere, they say, hey, you're kind of cute. <laughs> Wanna make me your wife? I promise I'll bring you lots of kids. Because we know in mythology, kids are very important. After all, how else does the bloodline continue? Who do you pass on your heritage? and your secrets to. Well, you need kids for that. You're not going to just trust your neighbor, right? But eventually, being a wild kitsune, they go, you know what? You're kind of boring. I thought this would be more fun. And I mean, yeah, I, I gave you kids. Yeah, I'm out. And then, <laughs> and then this Sad man has to go, my beautiful wife was taken by the woods. I do not know what happened to her. But there's some interesting parallels, as we will discover as we continue through these stories. For now, we are up to snakes. So, we are going to talk about three snakes, broadly, because some are not just an individual snake, they are a classification. First, the rainbow serpent. Has anyone heard of the rainbow serpent? Excellent, we've got some people. How about Naga? Ooh, more people know the Naga. And I've got a lot of people who are going to raise hands for this one because, well, marbles everywhere. Jormenfender, which I probably pronounced wrong because I don't speak Norse. So, we're going to look at these three examples and how they exemplify different aspects of snakes and symbolism of snakes. So for someone who was familiar with the rainbow serpent, where is it from? Australia. Australia, yes. Do you know what their role was in the mythology of the Aboriginal Africa? I just messed that up. Aboriginal <laughs> Australian people. Okay. Yes. It's the creature that's dreaming? Yes, that is correct. According to about half the tribes. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember what it's dreaming about? Existence. Yes. So in half of, well, roughly half of the Aboriginal tribes, the rainbow serpent is dreaming all of us. We all exist in this serpent's dream. It is the creator god. In the other half, still being a creator god, they are the one who rose the land from the sea and created a place for humanity to exist. They are the ones who separated the sea from the clouds so that there was rain and that man might have food and water to drink. Being associated with water, though, water gives life. So 
also takes it away. Because what happens when there is no rain? Drought. Starvation. Fire. What happens if there's too much rain? Floods. And being a dreamer, are dreams not fickle? Do we not sometimes go, okay, I made it to, wait, why did I walk in this room again? <laughs> right. Oh, right, I, I needed food, so I, I needed the fridge. Right? And then you just walk away, and the fridge is left open, and it gets too hot, and, well, humanity burns. <laughs> How about Naga? Is anyone familiar with where Naga are? India is one. They come from two places predominantly. India is one, and Southeast Asia is the other. So a lot of the island nations. They are typical in three primary religions, although you also find them elsewhere, which would be Hinduism, Buddhism, and Jainism, which I probably said wrong. But does anyone know what Naga's role is in mythology? Where would you typically find one in a story? Not counting World of Warcraft because they butchered it. <laughs> <laughs> you would typically find them protecting a temple. They are the semi-divine guardians of holy places. Isn't it interesting that as much as snakes are feared, they're often also often referred to as divine. With the rainbow serpent, they are the creator. With the naga, they are the protectors of the holy places of the gods. What about Jormungandr? Who's familiar with the myth of Jormungandr? Yes? Uh, he is the son of Loki, uh, who sleeps at the bottom of the ocean, uh, and for one day awakens from drifting and destroy the world. Yes. Jormungandr will one day destroy everything. Including uh, all of the gods, all of humanity, the entire planet, and depending on which way you want to interpret specific words, also the heavens. So not even the dead would survive. And because in Native American mythology, snake has wildly different interpretations based off of which tribe you're talking about, I will just say that almost always they are used as a transformative element. They are almost always some agent of change and transformation. Moving on to number three. Do people remember what the third animal was going to be? No. Yes. No. You are very excited about spiders. So I'm going to share another myth because this is one that I just find delightful. Has anyone heard of Anansi? Ooh, lots of people have heard of Anansi. If you heard his name, those who are familiar with him, what do you think about him? What kind of creature is Anansi? He's a storyteller. He's a storyteller. What else? He's a trickster, too. Yes. He is a trickster and a storyteller. So today, I'm going to share the story of how Anansi's hind became big and his head became small. <laughs> So, Anansi is from Africa, and if we know about Africa, there are places that are incredibly temperate, and places that are sun-scorched desert. But it was not always thus. At one point, rains were plentiful, and the land was fertile. But a drought came, and Anansi was thinking, you know, I really like some fish no water. And where there's no water, there is no fish. But he heard some spirits singing. And as he heard these spirits singing, he went, huh, they're singing about water. They're singing about fish. What if I sing along? So he joined them in their song. And when they noticed, the spirit said, whoa, you're not a spirit, dude. There will be consequences. 
I mean, we, we can shield you this once because, I mean, we, we didn't know, so that's kind of our fault. So here, we will help you. We will sing with you this once and help you obtain the fish. So Nazi goes, <laughs> yeah. Aren't I smart? I got the spirits to do all the work for me. They brought me fish. <laughs> well, fish only last so long. He got hungry again. And he thought, you know, how am I going to get more fish? Wait, I remember that song they were singing. And being the storyteller, trickster, absent-minded spider that he was, he went, they weren't serious about consequences. I mean, consequences are for please. Consequences won't happen to me. So he starts singing the song and drawing the fish, and well, his skull fell off. <laughs> <laughs> and when his skull fell off, he went, oh no! but inside the skull was fish. And he went, well, I mean, that's kind of convenient. <laughs> so he ate the fish, and then he went, wait, but how do I put my head back on? And he cried out to the spirits, help me, please, my head fell off. And the spirits go, we told you there would be consequences. But we are merciful. We will help you. This once, we will reattach your skull. And they did. And Anansi went, <laughs> they're so foolish. They'll do whatever I ask. And the next time he heard them singing, he went, you know, yeah, I think I want some fish again. So he sang along, and the spirits all stopped singing and looked at him, and his skull fell off. And they went, no, that's it. Third strike, you're out. And he went, well, what am I going to do? I need my skull. And they said, well... You're smart, you figure it out. <laughs> so instead of putting it back on his head because he couldn't figure it out, because he couldn't see, well, he put it on his butt. <laughs> and that is why Spider has a big ass and a small brain. <laughs> <laughs> Spiders throughout the world have this reputation. They are typically incredibly intelligent creatures. They catch what they need. They craft their own home. And this leads us to our second story about spiders. The Navajo Spider Woman. Has anyone heard of the Navajo Spider Woman? Okay. I was kind of hoping that. So, most Native American tribes have some form of Spider Woman in their mythology. She is often referred to as the Great Grandmother Spider, or Grandmother Spider, or the Wise Spider. Take your pick. Each tribe told the story slightly differently as they sat around their fires and told the stories of how the world was created. In the case of the Navajo Spider Woman, unlike many myths of spiders, she is not a bad person. She does not play tricks. She is not harmful. Instead, she is the stern grandmother who goes, well, you kind of deserved it, didn't you? <laughs> Just because I'm not going to punish you doesn't mean I'm going to save you. But, being a merciful being, she did say, I will give you tools to solve your own problems, though. And so there are, take your pick, probably a hundred different variations of this tale, of the women of the Navajo tribe saying, it is cold, and we have nothing to warm ourselves. She said, well, I can teach you how to solve that problem. So she taught them how to weave how to knit, and how to sew. And so the people were able to clothe themselves. And they said, well, now we're not cold, but we're hungry. How are we to get food? And she said, well, you can take this string, and you can take a stick, and you can make a bow. You can take this string, and you can make a net, and you can I'm not doing it for you, though. You've got hands. You can work. So that is why she is referred to as a grandmother spider. Now we're going to go back to Japan for a moment. I'm betting people have heard of this one. The 
destroy Google. Yep, I, I see some, some nods and hands of recognition. So, as is typical in Japan, uh, Japanese folklore, well, there is another bride animal here. This time, the devouring bride. Or the trapping bride. The smothering bride. Because Juragumo typically comes in one of three variations of tale. You wandered into a valley where nothing lives. That wasn't smart. And she eats you, because that's what spiders do. You went into her web. Number two, the scary woman in the castle, who is beautiful. But you don't want to stay overnight. <laughs> because if you stay overnight, well, you're probably going to be an empty husk of one. And number three is the beautiful maiden in the woods, who you come across, and she goes, Oh, it's so sweet of you to call on me, but you really should go. You, you should not stay here after dark. And the man goes, oh, but you're so beautiful, and you're so nice, and you gave me water. You gave me directions. Are you sure you want to stay here in the woods? I mean, I've heard there's terrible things in these woods. <laughs> and she says, I am fine. I have lived here all my life, but you really should go. So the man leaves. But the next day he comes back and tries to woo her again, and she says, you know, my answer's not going to change. You really shouldn't be here after dark. Please go home. Your family will miss you if you don't. <laughs> and how many people are familiar with this story of the man who does not get the hint? <laughs> this, this kind of exists in every culture. Well, he comes back again. And she goes, Dude, I told you. Stop. I'm happy here. Leave me alone. You just go home. Your village needs you. I don't need you. And he says, but, but you're so beautiful. I want you to be my wife. She goes, Okay. Here's the deal. If you can make it till dawn, I will be your wife. But you cannot leave this valley. If you can survive in this valley until dawn. But what happens? The sun sets, the moon rises, and the beautiful woman turns into an enormous spider who promptly devours the annoying man. <laughs> So what do we learn about spiders through this? They're smart. They create things. They are helpful. But they're also very dangerous when you don't leave them alone. They have boundaries. That is their role in mythology. So now we get to the one where every culture kind of argues, is it a raven? Is it a crow? It's a corvid. What is it? <laughs> so this one, as you can tell, I'm, I, I know I've done a lot of research into Native American because I have a little bit of ancestry and I'm trying to figure out more about them. So in Native American mythology, Raven fulfills two really important roles. Most tribes agree that Raven is the carrier of if you want to cast a spell, if you want to use your medicine at a distance, you ask for Raven's help. If you want to learn the mysteries of magic, you talk to Raven. But why do you talk to Raven? Because Raven created the world. Raven saw these poor humans, these animals who did not have fur, who did not have claws, who did not have fangs, and went, well, they're going to need some help. But the great spirits were like, what? They're fine. I'm happy up here. I got my fire, got my water, I got my land. I'm 
Okay. And Raymond says, yeah, but what about everyone else? You're good. You, you got what you want, what you need. But why'd you make them if you weren't going to help them? So he hatches a cunning plan. And he says, all right. I am going to bless your wife with gives a blessing to this child so that he can manipulate the child's body to steal fire. Because which grandfather can deny their grandchild the shiny bauble on the shelf known as the sun? When the child wants to play with it, what adoring grandfather can deny their grandchild? So the child at Crow's bidding, at Raven's bidding, takes the shiny bauble and throws it up the chimney where it rests in the sky. And man can now look upon creation and go, oh, there is a world. There is land. But Raven knows that they don't just need land. They need water. As we've seen in previous myths, water is very important. Civilization will succeed or die if there is water or not water. So he goes to the child again and says, hey child, remember how fun it was to play with the sun? You know that fountain? Why don't you just knock it over? Then you can play in the water. And what child doesn't like to play in the water? You know, just stomping around in mud, splashing. And at Raven's insistence and the child's exuberance, rivers, lakes, oceans were created where the droplets of water from the Great Spirit's house fell upon the earth. Raven is credited with many, many more myths along these lines. Take your pick. Something important to civilization, Raven figured out how to get into the hands of man. Humanity. When you read enough old texts, your brain goes, race of man, because, well, that's how the Christians read everything. <laughs> so for our second one about crows, let me just check time real quick. Okay, go. We're going to go to ancient Greece. This is one of the ones where they always argue, was it a raven, was it a crow? Because, well, Apollo's kind of a dick. <laughs> <laughs> so, has anyone heard of why Apollo turned the raven black? Oh, I see some hands in the back. So, what is Apollo in charge of? The sun? Yes. The sun? So Music? Much. Prophecy? Medicine. Medicine? He's kind of an important dude, isn't he? So what do you think important men like him do in ancient Greece when, well, they don't like the messenger? They don't like what the messenger told them. They kind of get upset. So Apollo said, hey, Raven, I want you to go see what, let me make sure I use the right names. <laughs> Uh, let's see what uh, Cronus is up to, because I fancy Cronus. Cronus is beautiful. I love her, as all Greek gods love mortals. They're so pretty. Whoops, I broke them. <laughs> <laughs> so Raven does what Apollo asked. He goes and checks on Cronus and goes, oh no. Is preggers and it's not yours. <laughs> so he comes back and says, Well, Apollo, you asked me to let you know what Cronus is up to. Well, if you see, there's this prince, and you were away for a long time, and he's kind of pretty and wealthy, and she made a mistake and got married, and now she has a kid. And Apollo went, well, why would you tell me that? And throws the sun at Raven. <laughs> but Raven, being 
being a bird is quick and nimble and just barely dodged out of the way. But his feathers caught fire. And what does fire do to feathers? It burns. And to this day, Raven is covered in soot. Yeah, Greeks, the gods were not nice. Very relatable, though. That's kind of their point. They are these giants of beings with magical powers who can do all sorts of incredible things. But they're just like us. Except they also are like, hey, you know what, Moon? You're pretty. I'm going to put you in my pocket for a week and, oops, oh right, humans, tidal waves. Let's just, no one's going to notice. China for a moment. And China is just where this is most accredited to. This myth goes to many other places as well, but if you do a quick Google search, it's all going to say it's China. But it's because throughout history, China was just, and still is to this day, massive. They also were the first people to do a lot of things like write down their histories. And, oh right, have philosophy, and try to explain things, and actually have libraries where they protect and stuff instead of let, oh I don't know, that guy down the street named Alexander burn everything down. <laughs> so, they have a story of the three-legged crows. Because at one time, there was not just one son, but there were ten. And each of these sons had a crow that lived inside of it. Specifically, a three-legged crow, because these were no ordinary crows. These are divine beings. But, as tends to happen, birds get hungry. And well, what happens when one bird makes a noise about, ooh, I found this tasty treat? The others come down with it. But the earth was not designed to withstand ten suns. When they all came down together, it scorched the land, creating famine. But, in China, there were also heroes. Beings of immense power and wisdom and cunning, and one of them happens to be, let me find his name so I don't say it wrong, Holy uh, Yi which I probably said totally wrong because I don't speak Chinese, but he was a fierce hunter, and seeing the three-legged crows descending and burning the earth, he swiftly drew his bow and slew nine of them. Because he understood we still needed light. We still needed heat. But too much was too much. And so he slew nine of the three-legged crows leaving us with the one we see in the sky today. Now that we've talked about these various myths, about these four creatures, we're going to do more of a discussion style for the rest of this. Let's see how much time we've got left. We have about 20 minutes left. So what are some modern examples? Because I am one person, there is so much media out there, I cannot consume it all. What are some modern examples of these four beings that you have seen in either television, video games, how much have they met up to these expectations, these mythological origins, and how much have they been different? How have there been new twists? Some examples that I thought of to bring forward are Grimm, the TV show, where you will find examples of all of these creatures. Um, Supernatural, which has its interesting take on mythology and religion. American Gods. Um, and this one might be controversial because it is a gotcha game, Hoyaverse. <laughs> because who can resist using the gods in their games because, well, they're free. So what are some anthropomorphic heroes that you've seen or 
heard of that you would like to hear more about. We can go deeper into ones that we've already talked about. I can branch out into other stuff. You might stump me. We'll find out. Yeah, heroes count. Heroes, gods. Yeah, gods count. Ganesha. Ganesha? Ganesha. Ganesha. So that's Indian elephant. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Hinduism is one I know less about. I know the very broad strokes. He is wisdom, and he is a scribe, if I remember correctly. He gave writing to the world. So why do you think those are attributed to an elephant-headed god? Oh, he's also mighty and, and strong, and uh, he breaks things a lot when asked to by other gods. <laughs> Why do you think those would be the attributes given to an elephant-headed being? Elephants don't forget. Elephants don't forget. What else? What else are elephants known for? They are strong enough that they can go, you know what? I don't like that tree. No more tree. Yes? But also the Yes. And they're incredibly kind who have been kind to them. There are so many stories that we see of real-life examples of elephants recognizing when women are pregnant, even before the women themselves do. Of elephants that will fight off lions for the humans that they have decided they like. Elephants are pretty impressive beings. They're just not one I have done quite as much research into yet, because most of what I've been focused on is the people who have come, and most of the people who have come to me for help are in the United States. <laughs> so I've helped a lot of people who are Native American, who are some form of Latin American, a whole bunch of white European uh, descendant Christians, many of whom are kind of looking at it going, well, Grandma wants this, but... I don't know that I want to live that way. <laughs> so it's, it's been a, a learning process on a lot of these. Are there any others that you can think of? Yes? Are you called Arachne and Medusa? Medusa, yes. And Arachne? And Arachne. Yeah, they, they both have tragic tales. So Medusa goes back to snakes. Do you feel like you can give a short synopsis of the tale of Medusa? Uh, in general, uh, she is a handmaiden at uh, one of the Queen of Shrines, mm -hmm. and is victimized in some way by Poseidon. Yep. And then is cursed, or uh, there is one where she is part of a trio of women, mm -hmm. uh, and they are sisters and track heroes. And yep, it depends on if you are looking at Greek or Roman, and what preceded Greek, which um, that gets messy. <laughs> yep. So one of the other interesting things about Medusa, her symbol was used on ancient women's shelters. Why do you think that she would be associated with women's shelters? Yes? Because she can defend herself. And in a civilization where, true, if you were an aristocratic woman, you had plenty of protections. But if you were not one of the wealthy elite, you had nothing. As a woman, you, I mean, you couldn't do day labor, you couldn't work the fields, you had very limited options if you were not a married woman in ancient Greece. And because of that, they had very few options of where to go if something went bad in their relationships. But, a lot of men, well, they don't want to be turned to stone. They're a little too interested in the finer things of life to be like, no, I don't want to just be a rock. I, I, I still want to do stuff. But that's also one of the interesting things about snakes. Transformation. <coughs> Medusa did not particularly want to become a hideous monster. But, isn't that how and we're going to get kind of philosophical here. We're going to keep it PG, but isn't that how a lot of people look at those who have been victimized? 
where they no longer look at them as a human. They look at them as some sort of pariah, as something that is dangerous that will harm them just by existing. And isn't it telling that then Homer writes about Medusa's death at the hands of this hero? For no real reason other than, oh, she has this nifty power that I want to destroy a bigger monster. Didn't even try to reason with her. Didn't even try to ask, talk to her. But, again, Greek myth, very brutal. But what about the world they were in? Do you know the political structure of Greece at that time period? Yes. That was great if you were in, in Athens. But each city was its own country. Today we call it Greece. But they were always at each other's throats. They were always at war. That's why we hear about uh, Troy and about, um, my brain just lost it. Sparta? Sparta. Yeah, Sparta. I'm like, I, I can see the, the image in my head, but like, yeah. <laughs> So isn't it true, isn't it interesting watching how their stories mirror the reality they were living in? So let's try to draw that concept forward. How many people here have watched horror movies? How many of you have heard that you can tell what Americans are afraid of at any given point based off of the horror movie that is most popular in a year? <laughs> Why? Why do you believe that this is the way it is? Yeah. And why do we want to tell those stories? Yep. It is to give a warning, and secondarily to say, it's not actually that scary. See, I can name it. I could talk about it. I'm not scared. Well, maybe I kind of am. <laughs> That's why so many of these stories are about things we're afraid of. Thinking about these entities of water. About raven bringing water to the world. About the rainbow serpent. Water was life or death. Is it any surprise, then, that many of these ancient myths deal with how did we survive drought? Which being brought us rain? How did we cross the oceans? Where did we find the water to feed our crops? But today, we don't really have many stories about that, do we? Except, if we go back to the 90s and the late 80s, <coughs> has anyone heard of Waterworld? Yes. Yes. Has anyone heard of Mad Max? Yes. <laughs> That fear hasn't left us. It's just transformed how we talk about it. Because we're no longer worried about the animals coming to get us. We're worried about that country across the ocean. We're worried about that city that is stealing all of the water from the entire state. We're worried about the humans around us. Yes? So would then Godzilla be an anthropomorphized Myth of oh, yeah. a man made nuclear type of disaster? Would that be a, a, a new myth? So it's that is one way you can interpret it. Because is Godzilla just a monster? Or does he have sentience? There's sentience to it. That means he's anthropomorphic. He has human like traits. He is more intelligent than just a lizard should be. Yes? Oh, I know it doesn't have anything to do with animals, but uh, Interstellar is a drought. Change. Yeah, we're still afraid of this. And uh, Interstellar has a double whammy because it's not just drought, it's also disease. There is a disease that is killing all of the corn and the other food crops. That is another major staple throughout all of history in our storytelling. Yes? 
Um, some, well, so modern mythology was just mentioned, but another interesting piece of modern mythology is Tolkien. Um, he had two mythological spiders in his mythology, yes. uh, Ungoliant and Shelob. Mm -hmm. Do you know much about those? I know, much, I know more about Shelob than Ungoliant. I, I'm the opposite, so. <laughs> well, Shelob at one time was a more noble creature who then got twisted, and uh, even Sauron was like, you know what? I don't want to mess with you. You stay in your mountain, and... Yeah, anyone who tries to come in, I'll just let you do your thing. Uh, I'm not as familiar with Ungoliant. Ungoliant, uh, so Morgoth is the the like the chief uh, antagonist in in the story, who was Sauron's master. Um, yeah. And uh, Ungoliant ended up tricking Morgoth into uh, being able to consume the two trees of Valinor, mm -hmm. which he wanted for himself, but uh, he, she had tricked him into giving her. The, uh, the power contained within those trees. And she grew so much, her ass became so much bigger than her head, that she eventually that, right? She eventually consumed herself before, and uh, she, she consumed all of her children too, besides Shelob. The only one of her children to survive. So. And if we look at where Tolkien lived in history and the things he had done, how many people know what war Tolkien was a part of? World War One. World War One. Do you know where he actually served in World War One? And what are some of the most dangerous creatures then? And poisonous spiders. Some of those spiders, if they bite you, you lose a limb. Is it any wonder that he would include them in the mythology of the world? He So we got five more minutes if people want any other discussion. Yes? Uh, I wanted to talk about Quetzalcoatl. Ah, yes. One that I know... Do you guys really have that? The Feather Serpent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. he, he was the god of like science and agriculture and all that. And there's a really interesting story about how he brought maize to the Mesoamerican people. So basically, I think there's different ways it's been told, but in this variation... They're like, the gods are like, what are we going to feed these people? You know, they need something to eat. You know, they, they're just eating all these, like, fruits and animals, and they need more. So, and Kastrofado ended up finding this mountain and saw ants going into the mountain to, and coming out of this drain. And he's like, oh, that looks delicious. I think the people will like that. So he turns himself into a black ant, and he goes into the mountain and brings one out to the people, and that's how they got made. Isn't it interesting? Because a quaddle, feathered serpent, again, Dima, transformation. He transformed into what was needed to solve humanity's problem. Yep. Yes, way in the back. Hi. Um, so, also on serpents, um, mm -hmm. I, there's an interesting like, bit of specific Buddhist myth around the Naga, where there was a Naga who wanted to become a monk. If I, mm -hmm. like, I'm not, this is not my fate, I don't know this super well, I just like vaguely remember it. Um, but was like uh, denied that because was a Naga and not a human. Mm -hmm. um, so it's sort of interesting with the being, this, like this class of being is divine and, and, and important and powerful in that way, but also shut out of enlightenment. And sort of like the way that the, and I'm even less familiar with um, uh, Australian Aboriginal myths, so I don't know that. As well, that's yeah. sort of like how the rainbow serpent in the dream, doing the dreaming is not as much of an active participant in it. Mm -hmm. So it's like powerful but separate. That's kind of that, that's that's interesting. And that's a common trope or theme in a lot of these myths are these semi-divine beings do not have the same capacity as humans. Because they are what they are. They do not change. And a lot of them become envious of humanity because we are capable of learning. We are capable of changing. And the Naga are an excellent example of this. They were created to serve a purpose, a divine purpose, but they don't get to pick their own path. Human beings, we get to go, you know what? My 
dad was a farmer, I don't like that. I'm going to go be a blacksmith instead. Or my mom was a seamstress, I don't like beetles. You know, I think I'm going to be a baker. And that was perfectly okay. But in mythology, these divine beings, they are what they are. That's why they serve such a intrinsic purpose that has not left our modern storytelling. We see this baked in to just humanity in general. And almost every place that has one of these creatures tells remarkably similar tales about them. Even though they are continents, oceans, and sometimes even millennia apart. But, some part of us recognizes a spider is dangerous. But, it's also a creator. Some part of us recognizes that ravens and crows are agents of death because they are carrion birds. But, they also lead people to food. They help they are incredibly intelligent. They take care of each other. Snakes can provide medicine. Or they can kill you because of the venom. Um, that's why uh, the symbol for... Uh, my brain just lost his name. It's not Apollo. It's Apollo's kid. Hermes. Yes. Yeah, uh, the, the serpent on the, on the pole. Um, that's why it is the symbol of medicine. Because... In so many uh, mythologies, we have snakes, both as the agent of chaos that kills people, and also the curative agent, because they can kill off the other offending um, entity that is attacking the human. So that pretty much winds up our time. I am super grateful for you all being here, because I was looking at it going... We're kind of late in the day. I don't know how many people are going to want to stick around. So thank you all for being here. Uh, if you want to be uh, mentioned in the video at a later time, the post is up here. If you want to get more business cards to share with people, there are more up at the front, and they're still scattered across the tables. Thank you all for coming. Thank you so much for watching my panel, and I did tell everyone there that I would shout out those who had attended, and so the people who had asked me to shout them out, in no particular order, are uh, Flash Quatch, I'm probably saying that wrong, F-L-A-S-H-Q-U-A-T-S-C-H, -S uh, Zeus the Storm, Otter Fate, Melon Gummy, Hari Heart at Bad Weather Forecast, Tabasco Foxy, and Nenwith. Thank you so much for being willing to put your names down and saying you were there. And as always, until next time, walk in the light, my friends. Bye!